The one thing about ship design we can all agree is that if a ship looks right, it probably will be right. But why is this the case? Well, I hurt my foot Sunday night. And so I'd be using my granddad's cane because that's relieving the pressure on the foot. However, this is another case of if it looks right, it is right. Why? Well, we know with a walking stick, it has to come right about up to your hip level. We know it needs a handle. We know this because we've been using walking sticks for centuries, millennia. We've been using variations on this. This is made of chestnut. And this is the sort of memory which gets passed on as a cultural institutional memory. So when we say if a ship looks right, it is right. The reason we're saying that is because of our cultural institutional memory looking at that ship shape and going, yeah, that fits with what other ships look like. But what about the history of design? How do we get to the point where there is an institutional memory of what a ship should look like? A cultural memory of what a ship should look like. So, the reality is therefore we use judging by eye a lot, despite the fact that we often do things like saying, oh, if you've put up shelving and judged by eye, oh, are you sure it's level? Well, you check it with this lovely device and go, Mm, yes, it is. Actually, I'll do it properly. It is. And, well, please, when you're putting up shelves, do actually check them. I know they don't look level in the camera because of the camera angle I have it at, but do check. Judging by eye, therefore, has a bit of a mixed reputation. You will judge a ship by an eye. You will judge a car by a cut eye. You will judge a house by eye. Think about it. How many times do you walk up to a building? Do you walk up to a car and go, hmm, that's good. Or there's something wrong, but I'm not quite sure what. That is what historians, anthropologists, etc. mean by cultural memory. It's the memory which is in old oh, population memory, to an extent. Uh, in companies, we of course refer to institutional memory and organizations. That is retained within the people and the people part of each generation of, of the workforce passing on their knowledge. Well, this is the wider effect. And this is something we have to think about in history. This is something we have to think about a lot in history because the amount of history which doesn't get written down and the amount of cultural knowledge and institutional knowledge which gets forgotten when it's no longer considered of use. In fact, it's vaporware, really. It will be absolutely essential while it's in the view and whilst people can see it, but the moment it's not in use, it's gone. If you're a historian, this is really annoying when you're trying to do things like researching ship design or etc. And there are lots of things which just aren't written down because they don't need to be written down. No one in the 18th century needs to really elaborate on what standard load of ropes will be for a ship of a certain time. You know the rig, you know the size of ship, the people involved will know the, uh, know the requirements of the rope being fitted with it. And which is why at the levels of government, where they don't need to know the specifics of ships, they're just getting huge aggregates of the amount of rope being ordered. And then you have to try and work out and go down and work out what the rope is for each individual ship, and you'll get some ships and you, you will get the details written down because they're written down incidentally elsewhere or the, a purser records it and records the actual measurements and so yes you got that but then you add those figures in and you go hang on this doesn't quite make sense what's going on here are you factoring wastage are you factoring corruption are you factoring in the fact that some ships require more rope due to their slightly differential rigging than other ships of theoretically the same site and same size And the thing is, 
if you had lived in a time and you'd walked up to a ship and it had been rigged incorrectly, you would have known. Captains. Sailing masters could walk on ships and it didn't matter. Didn't matter one drop. If it was theirs or not, they would be able to know if the ropes were rigged correctly or not. They would judge it by eye. And they'd make changes depending on the structure of the ship. So, for example, you could have a Spanish-built ship in the Royal Navy. It would have Royal Navy ropes. It would have been re-rigged to Royal Navy style, but it would not be re-rigged exactly the same way as a Royal Navy warship would be rigged because the Spanish ship wouldn't be built exactly the same way as the Royal Navy ship would be with the same positions for the ropes to go. Not in the exactly same way. Which is often why they then go for a major rebuild, and part of the rebuild is actually reshaping that. And why? Because commonality works, but also the British have it for uh, the way they do, because it suits the way the British use their ships. And the Spanish have it the way they do, because it suits the way the Spanish use their ships. Which are, broadly speaking, similar, but are just different enough, and have just that different level of institutional memory requiring to support them, that they're just different enough. Welcome to the joy of ship design. So the foundation factor of ship design, of course, is buoyancy. It's the first thing we think about when a ship goes into water. And buoyancy, well, there are several ways I can discuss it, but honestly, I think with the help of my little friend is the best way. So if you don't mind, I'm going to pass you over to my friend, Quackers McQuacky, in his special studio, without much further. So, buoyancy. Now, you've already heard a little bit of a chat about it, and there's probably going to be more after this, but why have I got a dog's bow in front of you? Well, because that rubber duck was not just an image. Using the water bowl I have for the fluffs in my office, and a little friend, I'm going to talk some more about buoyancy. Now, here is the thing. When we consider buoyancy and why it matters with ships, there are multiple things which can affect a ship, and especially a warship. But any ship. And the rubber duck is actually a fairly good system to explain this. Now the rubber duck, of course, moves through the water mostly thanks to either the currents of the water or external influence. It's not having to steer itself. It doesn't have engines or rudder on it. It doesn't have to account for those in its hull design. So it can afford to be the most buoyant shape possible. And you notice this buoyant shape is not that different, well, to a corral, a coracle. There is a reason for that. It's a very simple shape designed to keep up water, but also designed to allow the ducky to self right. It's important for little kids and important for big kids when they're playing on them. Now, I'm not going to cut this duck open because if I did, I would probably be killed by a horde of small screaming children. And possibly, more than likely, their, um, their mothers as well. Um, the, the, my view is they would probably get to me before the fathers did. They tend to be faster as a rule in my family, but leave that to one side. So I'm not going to kill a duck. But it's a good illustration. 
because this is going for maximum buoyancy and ability to self-right itself, which means top weight is important. But also it means the height it rides in the water is important. If it was too buoyant, if it sort of floated up here, that actually wouldn't be stable. It needs to float a certain amount in the water. And with this flat bottom, that actually helps it achieve its stability in the case of the duck. All these things are a factor. And again, it comes to do with buoyancy, but it comes into ship design. You have to think about a lot of things before you, when you are building a ship, let alone before you use a ship. And before you start building a ship, there's got to be a lot of knowledge built up. So one of the things I'm trying to keep as a theme throughout this year is the idea that technology doesn't come from nowhere. It has to build layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. Knowledge has to grow layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. And sometimes that will take a long time. Sometimes it'll be a very short time. But it needs to grow. And it doesn't come from nowhere. Now. Back to normal present. I'm sure now there are naval architects who are watching this video going, Ah! And good. I could be getting into hydrostatics, hydrodynamics, and all the other parts of ship design. I could be going, raiding my father's old books. I'm talking through that, but that's not the point of this video. This is a introduction to the history of ship design. To the broad speaking concepts, and they're what I hope you will find interesting. Because there are two things which come through ship design. First of all, there's you want to make a ship a vessel which floats, which is buoyant. And buoyancy is a factor of vessel density, i.e., something that keeps the water out of the space you're in. Now, as you get into steel, uh, iron, and steel hull ships, eventually you do get bulkheads which are not just length along the tunnel along the ship but also are up between decks and that will keep watertight compartments and air down but early ships do not have that what they have is keep the water out space inside is air therefore the ship is less dense than the water it will displace it it will displace the volume of water beneath the hull, sort of, of that space. It will displace it, but it won't sink because ultimately it is not as dense or not dense enough relative to water to actually sink. Which is why packing is quite important, but also there's the materials you're making it of. If you're making it of wood, well, there's often a lot of air and a lot of buoyancy already in wood. Once you dry it and you season the wood, that makes it less likely to rot and less likely to actually let the salt, sort of salt water corrupt it. But you also need to still protect that wood. You need to prepare it and you need to cork the spaces between the wood. So you need to find some way of sealing those gaps. All this becomes part of it. And it's a little bit of the science. Nicked, as it is, from Wikipedia, because all the designs and graphs and uh, actual pictures that display it I wanted to use had various universities all over them. And I wasn't sure if I really had technically permission, even though I'd drawn some of them, to use them. So I went quickly and nicked the one off Wikipedia. It looks broadly similar to one of the ones I drew myself, but the one I drew myself has a university name all around it. <clears throat> yeah. So, ship design process. Well, this is an important factor, and because I'm doing ship design today, and because I've not been feeling, uh, I've managed to injure myself this week, I am medicating with the best painkiller I know. An extra can of iron brew, which is appropriate. But the ship design process. 
if you want to make most naval architects, marine engineers, and other people involved in the ship design process happy, you do this far, uh, this size, this side. You start with what you want the ship to do. What roles, duties do you want the ship for? What equipment, therefore, you work out is necessary and the space does it need to do those duties? How many crew will need for that? And therefore, how many crew, how much space will need for crew? What range do you want to do? What likely speed? And then you work that all out and then you design the ship and hull around doing those duties. And that makes them very happy. This tends to produce a design which is long lasting in service, which is very good for your duties and will be in service with your navy or your company for a long time because usually it also produces a slightly more expensive ship. Why do I say more expensive ship? Because you haven't gone in with cost being your highest criteria. It's the role and duties you want the ship to do that's your highest criteria. However, the more common sign structure is you start with fixed criteria. This is for the treat era. So you have a weight limit, 10,000 tons, let's say. Let's do this Washington Treaty style. Or London Treaty, Versal. 10,000 tons is the limit for your cruiser, okay? Design, roughly 10,000 tons. What role duties do you want the ship to do? You come with a design which is probably greater than 10,000 tons. Especially once you've added in the equipment and space as you need to. And you start deleting things off until you get back to your desired weight. Or you lie and cheat. And produce a top heavy ship which doesn't actually do, or produce a top heavy ship which is a danger to crew involved. So your choice is either to produce a ship which is top heavy, a to lie, or to produce a ship which won't be able to do everything you want to, to do. That's the fixed criteria. And do you know what's one of the interesting things I've found in history and working through ships? And this is one of the things with studying stuff sometimes alongside my dad and sometimes along other people in my family who work with ships. The amount of times differential between the ship which would have been produced under this criteria and the ship produced under this criteria is not a long way. Sometimes we're talking 20% maximum difference. So if you were producing a 10,000, uh, to produce a cruiser which could do everything you want, it's 12,000 tons for that cruiser to do, but you're allowed a maximum of 10,000 tons. 12,000 tons standard displacement versus 10,000 tons standard displacement. Or you've got a fixed price. Da -da 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 -da. Okay, so if you want to do everything you want to do, well, it actually comes in at about 20% more than that. Seems to be almost always roughly 20%. And sometimes it sort of varies. You know, it's not always exactly 20%. But within an acceptable margin of error or margin of variance, it usually seems to be roughly a 20% difference between what will be produced by a fixed criteria and what will be started, what would be done if you start off with this process. And what's interesting is both of these processes have been around a long time. In fact, this one has been a more common one. There's often been a fixed criteria, and sometimes those fixed criteria are, this is what the shipyard can build with. They can use rivets. They can only build a vessel of this size because this is how big their yard is. Instead, and people, instead of taking the sensible long-term view, are going, "Well, let's just expand the let's expand the yard a bit so we can build things bigger, which would give us better infrastructure long-term." They go, "Well, that, uh, that's all we can build up to, so that's what we've got to build to." Queen Elizabeth class carriers, the new ones, good example of this. It's true. Um, CVA one again. The options we're looking at. All sorts of innovative ideas were brought forth, uh, thought of to build a ship of that size because to build anything bigger, you'd have had to do some infrastructure investment.
there are almost always fixed criteria involved in a ship design. It is incredibly rare you will get a scenario where you have a blank slate. But that would produce a better ship. And if we want to start off with ships which are produced under that sort of criteria, the closest class you've got in history are probably the King George V's before the Queen Elizabeth class battleships. They have almost no... Yes, they're continuations of the other 13.5 inch ships on them, but they have they are basically building this is what we want to do, and we're building a ship around this. And that's what they built. And you got the Queen of Class, where they are trying to build the best they can, but on a budget. We can go back further. So, we have a 14th century Ulibaran. Now, technically this is called the Ulibaran Shipwreck, but it's also sometimes called the Ulibaran Style Vessel. Um, it's one of those interesting things. It was found off the coast of Turkey, and... When we say this ship is old, we're talking 14th century as I would have learnt it, before Christ. Nowadays we call it before Common Era. And I'm not going to get into my minor discussion of why I find actually changing it from before Christ to before Common Era is actually worse, because that means it means we've now defined Common Era as before or after the birth of Christ, we just have taken out the Christ part of it, because that's supposed to be more inclusive. But we've basically defined it as common era based on one face, one religion's date of origin. Um, if you're going to change a system around, you have to change it properly. And if you can't, then you're just fiddling while Rome burns. Sorry. Anyway. I know why they changed it, but it just seems... So, the 14th century BC Ulibaran. It uses the Carvel method of construction. And we think it's got a, it's got a cedar keel. And... It's a really well-built vessel. And the fact is, this is not a first-generation ship. Okay, it's not massive. Cargo is probably Mycenaean. But it's also not exactly large. And this is a vessel that's sort of between 15 and 16 meters long. Shell first method. Um, using well, a system I'll be getting to in a bit, but it's basically produced a Carvel methodology. And a Carvel methodology normally is you construct from the outer hull in. And it's a really interesting vessel design. But also around the world, we have outriggers. We have Kamakau, otherwise known as the Fijian outrigger. Um, sometimes it's spelled uh, T H A M A C A K A U according to one book, and they could be right. Honestly, again, this is not my area of specialty. I know about these ships because they were around for so long. And they are a really interesting example of a vessel, which has been produced with very early technology. And they were very large, capable of traveling in the open ocean, and recorded as being up to 70 foot in length. Now, the ones in terms of Kamakau are usually dated to being invented roughly in the mid-1700s. But 
there is also a possibility that there were very similar vessels developed a lot earlier, and it is known there are vessels like that going around the world in other places in a lot earlier. So this is a logical solution to a problem of providing a buoyant vessel. Because if you think about it, you are literally, instead of, this is building a hull, working up, but this is providing, using the buoyancy of your materials, to build a system which provides, it's a smaller vessel, although it can be quite big, to provide that ability to stay afloat. To provide something which is stable and allows you to work and stay relatively dry and relatively safe. I'm not sure how I'm saying that on this particular description, but relatively dry, relatively safe on a journey. Now, ship design methodology is an interesting thing because, well, if you think about it, Papyrus, all these things that people write on and draw on, come on quite late and possibly quite often after we've started building some form of ships. So the first ship designs were probably were literally in someone's head as they were working it out and as they were developing it and growing it. And probably it started off as sort of small boats, corals, and grow from there. But we do know by the time you get to Rome, there is a sort of methodology going on of you do sort of draw out plans and start thinking things through. Now, some more construction methodologies. And this has an effect on a ship you're going to build. Because, think about it, if you are sewing your hulls together with Phoenician joint system, which is otherwise known as mortise and tenon joints, Phoenician joint system, tells you where it comes from. You are going to build a hull in a certain style. If you use the lapstrake or clinker methodology, you're going to produce a hull in a different way. This will tend to produce a lighter hull, which is going to produce a lighter, faster ship. But it's also got its own issues in that this will tend to produce a stronger hull. So lighter, faster ship that you can use for fast manoeuvring, high speed manoeuvring, this is produced something which if you want to start ramming people, is probably what you're starting to go to build around. Because you can build a very strong hull this way. But again, all this has an impact on how you design and build a ship and what a ship will look like. A ship which is built with this fashion, is going to have often higher sides. It's going to be bigger. But, as I said, this is going to be faster. This is going to ride the waves far more. This is going to... How do I put this? You probably still aren't going to have much of a, t uh, much of a good time with most waves, but, you know, you can do okay. Now, what's interesting is sometimes this is actually called sewing a hull together. So if you ever read that they had sewed a hull together, it's this system. And we have found examples of this on the Ulliburn ship, um, dated from, as said, 14th century BC and the Cape Gideon ship, dated to the 12th century BC. So, this is quite a common methodology, and this is the basic for most of ancient Greek and Roman and Carthaginian methodology in terms of ship construction. This is a more... how do I put this politely? Well, this system tends to produce you a nice, smooth hull. This, of course, produces a hull with these sort of lines on them. And... This also tends to produce not only a lighter hull, but it's also an easier to produce hull. 
So if you think about it, if you have a scenario where you have far more limited resources and far more limited time, this is going to produce your ship more quickly. That you are able to be used more use more quickly, but you are able to get a more complicated and tend to be more effective rig for your sails on this kind of structure of hull, especially if it's in its caravel and smooth form, which it normally will be. Whereas this one has a more limited rigging. It's basically square sails are us. There are exceptions though. There are exceptions. And please note, I do realize there are exceptions, but again, I'm doing a broad history. So, ship design methodology. So, you know, they're using sheets and they are doing some ship design. There aren't really naval architects as such, but there are shipwrights uh, who are specialist shipbuilders. And often they are families and firms which will last for generations. You can get, as time goes on, these things sort of expand. If you look at the Chatham, you have an example of this, where they not only draw up designs on paper, they then take those designs out and they'd sketch them out across this floor which if you go to the Hearts of Oak experience in Charlton Dockyard which I've been around and it's absolutely fantastic they show where they drew out the designs and the actual they drew it out to full scale so that it could produce forms and things to guide the carving of pieces of wood which would go in the ship so you're literally expanding up, you're growing up the design blowing it up, but that always sounds bad when you're talking about the ships I, I do know that's the phrase you're supposed to use but I don't like using the phrase blowing up when discussing ships, so you're growing up the design, you're expanding the design, so that you can turn it into reality, you're turning it from this drawing to this former to the actual real thing And it's a really interesting story as you walk along through the uh, through chapter card, you get taught this all. It's worthwhile going to. So ship construction methodology. It's also affected by what resources you have available. What kind of woods are you able to use? consider Britain we had a large number of trees and we were able to get at them if you look at those forests again you'll see they are located near rivers they're located near places where we can get to those forests and where they can be moved now again interesting discussions have come up on this on various videos when I've talked about producing the ships of line and the issues with them and people have gone, well, you know, some of these rivers are very small today. And they say, they were managed. It wasn't just a process of managing the forests. There was also a process of managing the rivers. And there was also a fact that the British would literally, it would use carts as well to move wood. And anything that was needed to move the wood would move the wood. It's kind of like coal uh, later on in the British industrial era. Industrial era you do not get in the way of the wood moving. It was a constant flow. It was... Let me put it this way. There was almost constant work for people in cutting down trees, shaping them for transport, then transporting trees. As soon as you went took a load of lo took a load of logs to wherever you took them in your point of the, of the drop-off or where they would be picked up, or if you took them directly to the yard, you then return to get more. It was a constant flow. And it need to be it needed to be to slake the thirst for construction. But think about that, you can't do that construction unless you understand a lot about the wood that's going on. The wood has been tested. You have and by testing the wood, well, you don't test it the same way we do. Today, we'd send it to a lab, we'd do all sorts of sampling, we'd do all sorts of moisture examinations, etc. 
to, to work out the strength of the wood. Um, in that time, they didn't. They didn't have those labs. They had to do a lot of testing by literally time. Sometimes they build things. Quite often they actually build things and just see how those buildings lasted. It all takes time. There's also the, the standard sort of form of they would know some wood is good because it had already, already been used so often in the past. They knew trees like that were good, and they'd look at the grain and form of that wood, and they'd look at the grain and form of a wood of a new tree which they hadn't seen before, and they'd go, hmm. That looks close enough. We that, that might well work. And then it's a bit of a hope and a prayer, because sometimes that's right. Sometimes it's not. Now this is something which my dad would have been familiar with. And if you go to Aberdeen, you will actually find they've recreated a sort of 19th century naval architecture office. I always remember my dad when he went around that around that particular museum, I'm, I'm presuming it was the Aberdeen Maritime Museum, because he was complaining about the office, he said, yeah, they had it labelled as 19th century. Uh, <laughs> it was very close to mine <laughs> when I started. I think the stool was actually more comfortable in their office than mine was. <laughs> yeah. It was hand-drawn. And it required a very, very standard, ha a steady hand to be a draftsman and a naval architect. Because it was hand drawn. Yes, you have rulers here and a system which is going to help you hold them in place. Well, that comes quite late. But one of the things that amazed me to the day he died with my father was the ability that he could draw perfectly straight line. And when I say perfect straight line, he could pick the angle. And it would keep straight and constant at that angle. It wouldn't deviate. If you think about anyone who's... Most people. Okay, we can start off, but without a ruler, uh, we'll start off... And it'll develop a sort of slight curve at certain points. All of us, naturally. Uh, depending on your left or right, it will develop a curve. Um, if you're left-handed, if you're drawing this line, it will go up. If you're right-handed, it will go down, if you go far enough. His wouldn't. He trained that point of humanity out of himself. And they have to be like this, because all these drawings have to be meticulously done. Because these drawings are not only what they base their calculations on, but what the ship is going to be grown up from. If you think about it, if you're building a ship and things don't fit quite right when you're constructing them, that's going to be the lay in work. You're going to have to modify it. We consider the construction I've got going on behind me. It's going to be finished off hopefully on Sunday. If anything is not quite right, I'll soon figure it out because it won't fit in together. And if it doesn't fit in, well, then I have an issue, and I have to fix it. And I have to go back again and work out where the problem is. Now with Lego, that's relatively quick and easy. And this Belfast should hopefully be completed on Sunday, if the new parts have arrived. But... If you're dealing with the actual real thing... That's going to be complicated. And also, if you get it wrong, well, if you get your figures wrong and you don't realize you've got your stability calculations, your buoyancy calculations, etc., wrong before the ship is launched, then the ship could well sink. And that's going to be very embarrassing and possibly lead to a loss of life. So, you check your facts and figures. Another good thing about this scenario and with the people working on these ships was you had to be prepared to check your facts and figures. Yes, you didn't approach the top naval architect, the master ship, right? 
unless you were blooming sure their mass was off. But if you were sure, you went and told them. And if you think about some of the great disasters from history, HMS Captain, etc., you can almost always find people involved in the design process who are going, I don't think the maths works on this one. I think there's a problem. I think there's a problem. And then being shouted down by people going, No, 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 I'm right because I'm important and I'm famous. And I must therefore be right. And one of the good things about naval architecture, and one of the things you see a lot in the naval construction program in the UK and the US and other successful navies, is they have a policy of, hang on, what did you say? You think this is wrong? Well, let's see if we can explain it. Because the difference is when you teach a treat that moment as a teaching moment. Because if you're the person in charge and you think, well, no, of course I, of course I must be right. But let's teach them, and instead of me reacting by telling them off and telling them they're wrong, let's teach them why I'm right. And you go through it again and you might find out, hang on, I'm wrong. Well, then you can teach them how you deal with that. Ah, I see what I, I see. What's happened here? This and this has been forgotten. And oh yes, sorry, so much work. You can get the style through it in that way, but if you react by shouting and screaming at people, you can't. So good naval constructors, good naval architects, will tend to teach through it. And that is again how you pass on and grow the institutional and the cultural memory of ships and their design. Now, as ship construction moves out of wood into iron and steel, first of all you have ships which are a mixture of materials and that creates its own construction issues. Then eventually you have iron vessels and then steel vessels. And again, architects have to relearn what they're building with. They have to relearn the materials. They have to relearn the shaping of the hulls because how you shape a wooden hull for its maximum efficiency versus how you shape an iron or steel hull is different. They're not, they're still similar, but they're different. They're different in shaping. In a wooden hull, it's very much like that, but in a steel hull, it might be more like that. And this has an impact. This has an effect on what you're designing and how you're building it. Not just on your methodology of construction, but the way you construct it. One of the really interesting things uh, that happens to shipyards is when they stop having to use wood, they start to get rid of the seasoning space they've used for... I guess that makes sense, of course, we no longer need seasoned timber in such quantities, or if at all, for our ships. I would need some deck plating, etc., and deck covering. Very quickly, that space gets sold off, and the shipyards which sell that space off are often the ones which then run into trouble. Because, actually, it turns out you need a whole load of other things to help make iron and steel work and be, and be shaped into the forms you need for shipping and ship the construction. And so, yeah, you thought you had a great space efficiency and you could sell off that land. Now you've critically undercut your business. Now, this has probably seemed a bit of a jumpy thing. It's been jumpy and it's been trying to get through to concepts rather than necessarily to content. Because there are going to be lots of videos throughout this year going into content. There is one next week on marine diesels, which are going into the nuts and bolts of ship design and ship construction. This is about very much looking at ships and working out what makes it look right. Why is the King of Class, despite the fact that they are constructed shorter than they probably should be, and therefore smaller than they probably should be, because of the lack of investment in infrastructure and decent sized dry docks, why do they still look right? They've got two islands 
They look funny, but they don't look wrong. Funny means it's unusual to our eyes, but we don't think they're going to start sinking. Well, it's because of that hole shape. It's because whilst the top might have, it might seem a little shorter than it should be, if you're really thinking about what Bryn needs from an aircraft carrier, and it might seem strange at having the two islands, but there's a logical reason with the gas turbines, etc. But when you look at it, that hull, that hull shape is very, very contiguous. It's contiguous with history. We can think about that hull shape and we have seen similar hulls on ships before and before that and before that. Generations have been seeing hulls with similar shapes than that. And this is what I mean about if a ship looks right, it is right. No one is worried about the stability of the Queen Elizabeth class carriers because we look at their hulls and go, hmm, yeah, that fits. And that's because the naval architects and marine engineers who were involved really did worry about stability and making sure it worked. But again, they made it work. And it fits. Throughout the history of ship design, the methodology of design, the construction techniques, have changed. But the broad speaking thing is designing a ship has been as constant as the designs of rubber ducks over their life extrapolations. Um, you know how you build a rubber duck. You know what a rubber duck does. There are many, 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 many variations on a rubber duck. This one is from Wareham Forest Lodge Retreat, a lovely place in Dorset, and it's really nice. You know how ships are built. You know how what a ship is supposed to look like. That is a good thing. It's a good thing to know what these things are supposed to look like. And it's a good thing to know what the design of a ship is supposed to look like. Because it allows you to spot when there are problems. Even if you don't know, if you don't aren't a naval architect, if you aren't a marine engineer, even if you don't know, because of that cultural, institutional memory we all share of what ships which managed to make port look like look like when we see a ship and it looks like it's riding low in the water and we can't see the plimsoll line or all those sorts of things we know there is a problem going on and when it comes to ship design and designing ships we will probably always be judging them by eye. But, luckily for us, there are naval architectures, naval architects, marine engineers, who will be doing the hard maths, and it is very, very complex maths, and physics, and metallurgy these days, to make sure the ships are constructed right, and they do stay afloat. So ship design starts off with basically people designing it from their mind and extrapolating up and growing up and going, okay, so we've got this thing which floats on rivers. That's good. We want to go over that larger body of water. Do they even have a concept of how big that body of water is? Possibly not. Probably they're planning on just hugging the coast. Probably they just consider it a very large river. Until they start going further on it. And then they find out, hang on, this is not a large, large river. This is something bigger. 
Oh, this is cool. And this boat, uh, this vessel, a thing with this shape, made of this material, succeeding in this, made in this way, gets to point A, from point B. Woohoo! Well, now we know we need to build something like this to succeed. And that's where shipbuilding evolves from. As you sort of you build up and up and up the knowledge. And that's why ships keep the ship shape. I know. Have you found it interesting? Um, I, oh, no, it's, it's close blockade on the 14th of February. I thought that would be more appropriate for Valentine's Day. Marine Diesels is the 21st of February. And 20th of February is Steam Rates. The wooden wall gets a hiss and a huff. Fun times. And I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you for watching. Take care. And, um... Yeah, comments. Today, the question is, um... Name a ship which you think looks right, and a ship which you think looks wrong. And say why. Love to hear your, sorry, your, I'd love to hear your opinions, but remember, it's not a case of it looking funny. Twin Islands makes it look funny, but doesn't necessarily make it look wrong. Still looks right, it still floats, it looks right as a ship. So what's it makes a look ship right, and a ship look wrong? Thank you for watching. Have your fun.